Sorry. Okay, so we are Parsha's Va'era, the second Parsha in Chomish Shemais. And, you know, there are certain things that in our head, I think, are such big buildups. And then they kind of like move very quickly in, you know, in, in the text, they actually don't take up that much space. And then there are other things that you think, oh, that would kind of, we'd breeze through that, but we end up having a lot of text about it. So this week's Parsha, we are going to cover, here's a spoiler, most of the Makos, most of the plagues that are going to, of the 10 plagues that are going to fall on the Egyptians, fall on the Egyptians? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Fall on the Egyptians. Befall. Befall, it's probably the word, right? Um, they're going to come in our mm -hmm. Torah portion. Next week, the Parsha of Bo, we're going to have the last three. So uh, a thing that I learned from my son when he was in like first grade, his teacher uh, taught them that, how do you know how to divide up the, the, um, the plagues because the parsha of Bo is made up of two letters. Bet and an olive. What's the numerical value of a bet and an olive? Three. Bet is two, olive is one. So the parsha of Bo has three of the plagues. And I always thought that's kind of neat. Okay. So next week's parsha is going to have three. We have seven going on this week and it's going to become significant and we're going to discuss that. So first of all, what's going on in our Parsha? Uh, the beginning of our Parsha starts off and, and really I want to move quickly so that we uh, so that we spend some time really talking about things as they're meaningful for us in our life and in our development. But we still have to know what's, taught, what's going on in the Parsha. So the beginning of the Parsha is actually a continuation of last week. Last week, Moshe went, Moshe and Aaron went to Paro. He said, let my people go. And Paro said, no. And not only am I saying no, but evidently you have way too much time on your hands. So I'm going to make the, the slavery worse. I'm going to make, I would make it harder for you. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and the Jewish, and, and it didn't, and it didn't help anything. Right. And, uh, so Moshe finishes off and he says, uh, he basically says to Hashem, like, huh? Like, what was that about? It didn't, you know, you send me against, you know, we argued about this for so long. I don't want to go. 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 You're like, go, go, go. You can do this. You can do this. You can do this. I'm totally paraphrasing the conversation. You understand? And then I go and not only nothing, nothing would have been a good response. This is like a negative response. It got worse for everybody. So that was how last week's Parsha ends, ends off. And this week's Parsha opens off with Hashem responding to Moshe that Va'era el, el Avram el Yitzchak el Yaakov. I, I appeared to Avram and Yitzchak and Yaakov and they never had this name. It says, Shmi Hashem lo no lahem. It's in verse three, that the name of Yud, Yud and Nehe and above and Nehe, which is God above nature, they didn't know that, and Rashi, and, you know, you know, goes into different conversations, and and in Hasidus they talk about what do you mean they didn't know the name? They never Hashem never used that name, but they never saw the manifestation of that level of Hashem, and kind of Hashem telling him like, you know, why, why, why are you arguing with me? You know, kind of situation, and and he says we're gonna go do this now, yalla, let's go. So then Moshe responds. Uh, Hashem, oh, so first of all, I wanted to point this out. I forgot that I want to point this out, right? So in verse uh, six and seven and eight, we're going to end up having keywords in these verses in Hebrew that are going to become significant for for Passover, for the Pesach Seder. These are words that we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna we're gonna highlight for a second. So Hashem is telling Moshe to go tell the Jewish people. I'm going to take you out. And in, when, you, when we talk about Pesach, when we talk about there are four, four expressions of redemption. So the first one is going to be I will take you out from under the, how do we translate that? Somebody has the English in verse six. Therefore, to say, children of Zion, your God, I will take you out from the burdens of Egypt. Okay, okay. So, I will take you out from the burdens of Egypt, and then 
And I will save you from their labor. Vitsalti, I will save you from their labor. So that's the second expression of Gula. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Right, Vigaalti, and I will redeem you. So so far we have three expressions of Gula in the same verse. Okay, and? I will say absolutely. That continues, yeah. And then in verse seven? I will take you as a myself. Okay, so Vilakati is going to be the fourth expression of Gula. So we have four expressions of Gula. They're right here. Vihotseti, Vihitsalti, Vigoalti, Vilakati. There are four different expressions. And Adina, you read the full phrase of it. So that's right here. Um, and and uh, and 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 they and they will know, right? That I am Hashem, who took you out of Egypt, blah, blah, blah. And verse eight says, I will bring you to the land. And regarding which I raise my hands, swearing to give it to Abraham, and give it to and to Yaakov. And I will give it to you as a heritage I am God. Right. So, so Hashem finishes his, his, you know, I don't know his tirade, that doesn't sound, that's not the right word, but his, his response to Moshe, Moshe complaining, what was this all about? And he's like, yeah, the big stuff are, are coming. And when we talk about it specifically for Pesach, we always say there are four expressions of Geula, even though in the Torah we have five Veheveti bringing us into the land of Israel. That was something that the generation that left Egypt did not experience. It was by their choice at the end of the day, right? The generation that left Egypt was not the generation that goes into the land of Israel right? Um, we'll get to that later, but but so that when we talk about the four expressions of Gula, we do not include Veheveti, and we talk Veheveti now, like when we talk Pesach, it's more future, that when Mashiach comes, not that, not that one, but Veheveti going for when Mashiach comes, I will bring you to the land that uh, that you, that uh, that I promised to Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov. And Moshe says, Moshe says, um, uh, Moshe says this, this to, you know, take a look at verse nine. Someone want to read to me? Go, Sarah. So Moshe spoke accordingly to the children of Israel, but they did not do the action because of the goodness that he had. Right, so the first thing that, that is such a powerful statement when we talk about for ourselves, uh, the, a couple of things I want to say. First of all, the Hashem says, I'm going to uh, redeem you from Sivlot Mitzrayim, from the, from the slavery of Egypt. And if anybody's been hanging around Israel, what does Sivlot sound like? A word that it sounds like. When you start getting a little bit impatient, they tell you, Savlanut, Savlanut Kibet. I get Savlanut Kibet, right? Savlanut, patience, patience. And the first thing for ourselves that we need to know is that place of being patient with a bad situation is the first step to having a change. Until the Jewish people do not realize like this situation can change, until they realize this is the status quo that we know is not good. And until they get to that place, says, I'm going to take you, which I didn't know when you translated was the the burdens or something. That's the literal meaning of the word. But we also say etymologically, it's connected to that place of sablanut, of being patient and just saying, it's fine, it's God's will. It's met. You need to be bothered by this. You need to want to change before any change is going to happen. If, you, if, it does, if it doesn't bother you, if you can still so well, if you can still deal with it, if you can still carry it, then you're not going to look to change it. And that's the first thing that Moshe has to tell the people. But Yes. Isn't that the opposite of patience? What? This has got to change. It's correct. Correct. The oh. patience is the, in this case, patience is a bad thing. So the first step is not patience. The first step is taking you out of the patience. Got it. Take you out of civil time. Take you out of their place of, it's all sababa. Everything's fine. Okay. It's not ideal, but it's, it'll be okay. Can somebody please turn off the heat? Falling asleep as I'm talking. Thank you so much. Um, so that's the first thing that we have to know. Like that place of, of understanding that this has to change is the first thing that Moshe has to do. And what happened to the Jewish people? Sorry, you just read it. Were they able to hear what he had to say? No, no. Why? They couldn't. They, because through oh. the people, the people had shortness of breath and they were working so hard. You know, sometimes we're in a rut and there's a part of us that says, this isn't so good for us, but we can't stop because 
we have things to do and we're we don't have a chance to think about it and say am i on a am i like a hamster on a little wheel or am i actually doing and growing and being and going someplace and if i don't even have the time to breathe you know we all know that you know sometimes like we're so stressed we're in such a place like to take a deep breath is hard it's something that we're like we can't do that and the people could not hear my chef. They could not hear shortness of breath. There's too much work. Like, don't talk to me about redemption. We have bricks to make. We have things to do. We have to keep moving, 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 moving. True of them. It's so much more true for us. There's so many times where this is our routine and this is what we do. And how can I stop to evaluate and say, is this where I should be going? Is this where my effort should be, you know, is this where I should be putting my effort? Is this really my path to redemption? Or am I in a an Egypt? Am I, am I digging myself deeper and deeper into an Egypt? And if I were to stop and think about it, I would say, oh, wait a second. Uh, no, this is not good. This is not healthy. This is not making me a better person. And therefore, no matter what it is, I have to be able to take the time to stop and to breathe and to, to think about it and say, where do I go from here? And what do I do with this information? And the, and the first, the first response is they can't, they can't even hear words of redemption, you know, and it's easy to look at them and say, couldn't you just listen? But if we were to look at ourselves and there's sometimes when we're in a place, that's not a great place. And we can't listen. Like, you know, I, I don't want to hear this, you know, I must've told you this because I tell this to everybody multiple times, but I remember when I had four kids and I actually did the math years later and my four kids are five years apart. So I was standing and somebody came to me and said, oh, it's never going to be this hard ever again. You know, the kids will be bigger. There'll be more help, whatever. And I remember thinking to myself, like, do I look so pathetic? You're actually going to walk up to the street to me in the street and tell me this. Like, and I don't want to know that, it's, that I don't want to know. I don't want to know that it could be different. And I don't want to know that it could be easier. I just, just, go just go and i it resonates this inability to hear words of redemption it resonates in such a deep way for for me if it doesn't for you then sababa that's also fine um so then we're gonna have so then we're gonna have uh then hashem's telling moshe and Aaron to go speak to paro moshe's gonna pr protest again and then shani is going to give us a listing a genealogy of Reuven, Shimon, and Levi, the first, the three oldest tribes. We're going to figure out, we're talking who these Moshe and Aaron, where do they fit into the picture? So it's going to paint us a picture. Rashi brings up over here that, um, that these three tribes, when Yaakov blessed them, they got a little like knocked down. They didn't get like this elevated blessing. Yaakov really, you know, kind of hit them for the stuff that they hadn't done properly. So here Hashem's listing their names to bring them you know, to give them like that power, that positive power and, to, and, to, and they're listed over here. Okay, so what's the first thing that, that Paro is going to do? Moshe is going to tell Paro. Again, Moshe, Moshe is complaining again. Where we're not gonna, that's not where we're going to get to right now. So he says, so Hashem says to, says to Moshe that you go speak to Paro. Aaron's going to be your interpreter. He's, and, it, and the word for it is Nivyecha. He will be, he's not your prophet. He's your spokesperson to use, a, to, you know, Moshe, the uh, Moshe tells it to us multiple times in the Chumash, and the Medrash tells us as well. Moshe had an incredible, incredible, difficult time speaking. He was not born with a speech impediment, but he definitely, you know, the Medrash tells a great story. That right? That okay? Good. So we, so that's one thing. But um, but he wasn't born with a speech impediment. But he it got progressively worse and he describes his, his, re his relationship with his speech. And so Hashem says, fine, so Aaron's gonna translate you. An interesting thing that the Medrash points out is that when Moshe taught Torah, he did not have the speech impediment. That didn't- Who do you teach Torah to? The oh, Jewish people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought you were talking about like the Egypt. No, 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 yeah. Right, so in Egypt, when he speaks to, when he speaks to the Pharaoh, he needs an interpreter, but he does not need an interpreter when he's going to speak to the people uh, and when he's going to teach Torah. Okay. And so what does he go? He says, Hashem says, Hashem says straight off the bat, 
not making this easy for Pharaoh. I'm not making this easy for Pharaoh. So the first thing that they're going to do, Moshe and I are going to come into the palace and they're going to take, you know, every good uh, legend has its source someplace, right? So we know that Moshe is going to be acting with a stick. So if you're into any kind of, uh, you know, fantasy or science, you know, they, they, they're that image of a stick that is, that has extra power is not a wand, but like the Medrash actually says that there was a stick. Tell me if this story sounds familiar. The Medrash actually tells that there was a stick in Midian someplace in a stone and nobody could take the stick out. And when Moshe came and he was shepherding the sheep and he needed a stick and he just took the stick out of the stone and then they're like, well, how'd you get it? You know? So uh, we've heard that story in other versions as well, right? So here's the Medrash had the first, the first version of that one. So they have the stick. They're gonna, the first thing they're going to do is that they're going to take the stick, Moshe and Aaron, they're going to throw their sticks down in front of the Pharaoh, and it's going to become a snake. It's going to become a snake. And the, and the magicians are like, big deal. And they take their sticks, and they throw them down, and they become snakes, and, and they're not impressed. And then the Torah talks, and I think you're doing this in the Mimer, that his stick swallows their snakes, blah, blah, blah. Um, in English, there's an expression that you might know and nobody else is going to know, bringing coal to Newcastle. Okay, you don't know it either. Uh, bringing coal to Newcastle is an expression. Uh, bringing something that to a place that has it in great abundance, bringing snow to the Eskimos. They were like, you're bringing magic to Egypt? Like, this is our thing. We are not impressed with this. We, th this is not impressive. Look, boom, we can do this as well, okay? And the thing that we have, and we talk about a lot on the first talk about, God wants to get the Jews out of Egypt. He has many, many ways to do it, right? He could just like take them out. He's God. He could do whatever he wants. He could have the Pharaoh escort them to the border. He could do whatever he wants. What is the meaning of having, what does it need to have so many plagues? Why do we need 10 plagues? Um, why do we need to, you know, what is, what is the point? So there's a, we have a conversation. Is it for punishment for their behavior? A lot of the, the commentaries go along that line that they were so terrible to the Jewish people and the punishment had to be commensurate with what they had done. That's one thing. The other place that we talk about is um, uh, is a place of, of, uh, of teaching, right? One of the things, a phrase that we hear over and over again, v'yedu paro, v'yedu mitzrayim, v'yedu so that they should know, people should know that there is a God. And by, by working through all the plagues, we end up it being a, yes, a punishment thing, but it's also a teaching place for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians and for the Jewish people. Okay. So we're going to have the next, the, the plagues are going to start coming fast and furious. The snake situation did not impress them. So the next thing they're going to do is they're going to have the first plague. What's the first plague? It's in chapter seven, uh, verse 17 and 18 and 19. What's the first plague that we're going to get? Blood. Okay. Can I erase, erase the word? Okay. So the first thing we have, we're going to have the... Plagues are going to end up being grouped in multiple. You can you can you can group the plagues in multiple ways. That was what I was trying to say. So the first thing that we're going to have, and if you follow along the pesukim, we're going to have the plague of blood. We're going to have dam. Okay. Now we're going to find that Hashem says to Moshe to go to the Pharaoh and tell him about this plague. So. The way the plagues ended up working is that the plagues took, each plague took about a month. So we have the first plague, there's going to be a warning. Pharaoh's going to get a, Moshe's going to give, Moshe's going to give Pharaoh a warning. It's going to go for three weeks. He's going to go visit him at the Nile. He's going to go visit him in his palace and he's going to say, send out the people or I'm, we're going to turn all the water into blood. So for three weeks, this is happening. And then week number four, What's going to be the plague? Who actually is the one who strikes the water? Sarah? Aaron, right? Aaron is the one who's going to end up striking the water. Okay? And Aaron does this plague. Why did Aaron do the plague? Because Moshe doesn't want to strike the water because the water saved him from... Exactly. Exactly. Because as a baby, he had floated in the Nile. So he's not going to do the first three plagues. Aren't going to do the first two plagues. Two are going to, the first two are going to be directly 
directly directed against the Nile. And one, and the, and the third one is going to be the lice, which is going to be the earth. We're going to get that in a second. But this place of gratitude or ingratitude, Moshe's like, it's not right for me to, to bring this plague. Meaning God says, do it. And it has to happen, but it doesn't have to be Moshe because that's paying back with the bad. And it, it, imagine like for, a, for an inanimate object, the, the, the water and we have to and emotionally be so careful that Torah is careful to tell us he didn't do it because it wouldn't have been the right thing to do how much more so when we're dealing with people to, to, to deal with that so we're going to have Dom then we're going to have we're going to have what comes next frogs okay the frogs are again going to have the warning and we have our eyes going to be this plague and the third plague I learned when I came to Israel what's this third plague Lice. Okay. Um, and the third plague has no warning. So if you were to like stay, if you were gonna like uh, produce this as a movie, this is a point where like you have dramatic music saying, oh my gosh, something's like the silence is gonna be deafening, the three weeks of silence. And then we're gonna have the all the dirt in Egypt is going to turn into lice. And I Rose, just thinking about it makes all of us right, but it gets worse because it, think of every single place that has dirt, and all of that becomes is going to become lice. It made it worse. Okay, uh, then the next plague is going to be the wild bees. Okay, they're going to have a warning again. So you're going to have three weeks of warning, a week of a plague, three weeks of warning, a week of a plague, three weeks of silence, and a week of a plague. Then you have the wild beast. Moshe's gonna do this one. Uh, what do we have after? Who's following along with me? Dever, right. How do you say pestilence? Dever is called pestilence? Okay, I don't know. The sickness? Huh? Yeah, sickness, right? Yeah, yeah. Pestilence. No, not yet. Pestilence, I don't know. This is sickness. sickness. Pestilence is dever, it's like a it's like a plague on the animals, dever. Yeah. Animals die. No, no, not the wild animals. This is the wild no, animals. The animals die. Animals die. Exactly. So then you have the pestilence. I don't know if the T is silent or not. It's either pestilence or pestilence. I think I spelled it wrong also. Yeah. I feel like it's spelled wrong, but yeah. Sumi has two E's, right? So you have an E, no I. Pestilence. No, it's an I, I. but then, then it doesn't matter. It's it's bad. The animal, well, and here the and here the warning is that it's going to come, and all the animals that are out in the field are going to die. And anybody who feared God brought their animals into the house, and anybody who didn't left them out. So there's already like there, there, things are getting things are getting uh, mushy over here, right? Um, uh, and then we have boils. Okay, and Moshe and Aaron are going to do it together. There's no warning for it. Moshe and Aaron are going to do this one together. There was a warning for a pestilence, right? Yeah, yeah. Warning, warning, no warning. Warning, warning, no warning. Okay, and then they talk about the, the Chumash says that Moshe and Aaron each took a handful of ash from the, from the furnace, put it all on Moshe's hand. Probably is right now, I don't know. And he threw it up. And it came down and it landed all over Egypt as boils. Boils are like on your skin? Skin. Like Wait, ash from what? They took from a furnace. Ash. What, what furnace? It doesn't say which one. It says. In our house? From, a, from where, wherever they were taken. It doesn't say from, yeah, like from a house, not from a, a smithery or whatever. And they each took a handful and then they put them all on one hand for Moshe. And Moshe throws it up. and it's it, not my no, it's not. It, well, they talk about it. It brings it, Rashi brings it, and they talk about taking the Pierre. They say to take it, and Moshe throws it. I think it's in the puzzle. Let's, we can take a look. Um, here's the Dever, is in chapter nine. Um, yeah, uh, chapter nine, verse eight. So Hashem says to Moshe, take. Uh, full handfuls from the kifshan, and Moshe is going to throw it into the into the sky. So obviously Hashem's helping them with this one. They're doing this one together, um, and then one, two, three, four, five, six. And the last one that we have here is um, uh, hail, hail. 
Okay, and the hail is going to end up being uh, the hail is going to end up being ice with fire inside. It's hard to describe that. So that the hail hits, cracks, and then you have fire. So all different kinds. of This is what's going on over here. Next week we have the last three makas. This is the general overview of of what's going on. Um, if we we used to have here a hagada um, that was like. I think I maybe didn't have a super great imagination as a kid because these things always seem kind of like, whatever, you know, like whatever. <laughs> and then you see like uh, illustrations that are based on Medrash and different commentators. And it's like, oh, wow, wow. This just got much bigger, you know, much bigger. We know in the Haggadah, they had this whole conversation about how many places was it, it was more, whatever, uh, which we're not going to get into now. But Tachlis, like, so what? First of all, so what, right? Meaning it's great and it's amazing and, and Paro gets, you know, whatever. But at the end of the day, like, what is it trying to tell us? And, and according to Rashi, that the first three plagues, the Jews felt it. They didn't, they weren't affected by the plagues, but they, but by the wild animals, that's the first time that it says that I'm going to separate the land of Goshen and it's not going to be part of, the animals are not going to come in there. Now, we know the Jewish people had water. We know that in the first plague, we know that they had water. We know the Egyptians did. But there's some place where that was such a dramatic demarcation of the animals not going into the, into the land of Goshen where the Jewish people were. That somehow became like the, the demarcation of the, of the situation. Parenthetically, and hopefully I'll try, it'll, I'll, this challenge will make sense when I finish. Um, uh, it's like this challenge makes sense. Yeah, it feels like it's a little bit of a challenge in my head. Um, and, um, pre, there's a conversation from when are the Jews no longer working? So the slavery stops everybody. Every, the, the question is like for the first plague, but very soon after, Mitzrayim is going to disintegrate into Balagan, and then they're not actually going to be working. So when we talk about the Jews and it comes time for the actual exodus and people want to stay in Egypt and you're like, what, what? Who doesn't want to go to, with Moshe to get the Torah? Like who doesn't want to do that? You have to remember that for the last, for sure, eight, nine months, possibly even 10 months, Mitzrayim has been awesome. Mitzrayim has been awesome for them. They're not working. They're not enslaved. They can do whatever they want. Because, because the plague, because Egypt is being decimated by the plagues and they're hopefully learning their lesson of being, you know, having a relationship with God. We're going to, we're going to talk about some of the, some of the plagues and talk about, talk about it a little bit, but you know, our, our ability to, our, our short, our, our ability to like, I keep saying, I said this, this, like, I feel like this is something I've been talking about a lot. Our ability to fool ourselves is, is endless. The, the human beings capacity to fool themselves so for the last nine ten months Egypt's been great you know it's beautiful and they were doing their thing and they were visiting their friends and their family what are they learn whatever they were doing they weren't and they so quickly forgot this is not a good place for us we were enslaved here for 210 for 210 years this is not our place we are not wanted here and the fact that the last little bit was cushy made people forget already. There are three more plagues in next week's Torah portion. Oh, so when you say 10 months, you mean just the past 10 months? It's been Not here. Well, it's going to, let's say, by the time the Jews are going to leave Egypt, ah, okay. there from the time the Jews leave Egypt, going back, the last 10 months ah, have been, yeah. they haven't been working, they haven't been be beaten, they've been living and, you know, and our ability to say, no, no, it's not as bad as we thought. Yeah. It really wasn't, you know, it couldn't, it, it, it we probably didn't remember it properly. We're, the ability to fool ourselves is very, very, very powerful. So in the conversation of, of plagues being there as a learning experience, I want to highlight two. I want to take the first one that we have and the second that we have here. And I want to also, I want to send you, whoever wants, whoever is interested, there's a really, really fantastic essay by Rabbi Yossi Jacobson. It's both on his site, the yeshiva.net and on chabad.org. And it says 10 ways to ruin your life. And he has a whole conversation, he has a whole essay about, um, about how the plagues are the negative version of the pot of, of the midot, of the characteristics of from starting from Kesser, Chachma, Bina, Skipping Das, 
chesed, vort, feres, netzach, chal, yisod, malchus, all of those, all of those midos, the plagues are the answer to the Egyptians um, um, messing them up. Instead of using these midos positively, we're going, they, they use it negatively. And so the plagues are going to be uh, the rectification of their misusing the midos. And so it goes reverse. It goes reverse. It goes, no. Yeah, yeah, that was malchus. So, so that's why when you say, why are there seven and three? Because we know we have three emotional and we have seven emotional and three intellectual. So they're actually split into two different parashias. So instead of me giving over his essay and it not being so clear, I'm sending everybody to that essay. I think it was very good. I want to highlight two of the makas. Okay. The, I want to talk about the first one that's in our parsha and the last one that's in our parsha. So the first conversation of having the Nile turn into blood. Okay. So there is a sicha and he talks about what is the nature of water? It flows and it spreads. It spreads. It's cold, right? Hmm? Doesn't have a shape, right? It fills whatever shape you whatever shape you want it. You, it, you fill it, you put it into it, it's gonna fill. But the point of the Rebbe Hayat in Sicha is that it's cold and that it is and that it is that is like in a, on, a, on an emotional level, it's that ability to be cold and analytical, to be able to say, to look at something strictly from like like a, a you know an intellectual point of view, and the Rebbe says that in our service of Hashem, when you want the first thing that we need to do when we look and we say, does this make sense? And how do I do this? And what do I do? And blah, blah, blah. The first thing we have to do is we have to put blood into that situation. What's blood? Blood is emotion and blood is passion. And blood is, you know, we talk about whenever you talk about when somebody gets very, very heated up, right? We talk about them, their blood is boiling, their face gets red. The positive side of that, the positive side of that is because you know the emotions we could run away with our emotions and be totally lost in, in the netherland and that'll be you know whatever that'll be terrible but when we look at our relationship with Hashem and it's cold and it's analytical and did I do it and what's the mitzvah and how much do I have to do and da, 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 where's your passion where's your enthusiasm where's your fire where's your what is getting your blood pumping in your relationship with Hashem? Because if it's not, you need to add it first. That's the first thing that, that, that the Makas are teaching us, that this place of just calm analysis and everything is sababa, or it isn't, or what do I have to do? Right? Where does that give room for our personal emotional expression? And when we only are talking to Hashem, when our relationship with Hashem is only on the cold analytical, we're missing a very, very strong component in the first thing that we need to put in is to put in that blood to put in that that uh that put in that passion and, and that and that enthusiasm so that's the first thing parenthetically when we're talking about the plagues if you think not having water for a week wasn't bad enough right so the torah also tells us that all the fish in the all the fish in, died because they couldn't live in in blood um and so then you have the residue of that a stomp, stomp as a side bar for the for the plague. It's not just once the plague, once the week is over, they're still left with, you know, we know when you have places that are, you know, there's places that are, there's a, there's not, it's not clear that you have other, other things that happen. You're gonna having piles of dead fish is not gonna be healthy for anybody besides not having water for a week. So I'm just saying, stomp. Where did the blood go? When it was gone, it just left. We talk about creating, it disappear? didn't disappear. It went back to water. The blood oh. didn't have to be, we didn't, they didn't actually pour blood into the river and then change it, right? It wasn't like, oh, we poured so much blood, but when it was over, then the, then the blood just went away. You know, there's a, a very famous Hasidic story about people, different people talking about how, if, you, if Hashem wanted to destroy the world, how would he destroy the world? You know, how would, what would it take to destroy the world? And like, this one, and this one, and then well, if you burn it, then there's ash, and there's this, and, that. and somebody, possibly the Altrab, I don't remember for sure, said he would just stop creating it. Mm -hmm. Like, if we talk about Hashem creating the world all the time, then um, just stop creating it, and it doesn't happen anymore. So when the plague is over, Hashem just, stop, just stops creating the, the blood 
in the Nile. And then it just goes automatically, it's gonna go back to water. But the, but the residue of the fro of the, sorry, of the, of the fish, that doesn't disappear. That's gonna end up being like a, a side effect of the maca. The maca was the blood, but the side effect is having to deal with dead piles of dead fish for weeks on end. And what are they gonna do in the middle of Egypt with no refrigeration and no way to deal with this? Do you have a question or a comment? I'm surprised that I just said the Rebbe said the first thing we needed blood to the analysis. I'm not surprised that he said he needed it at first because it's how bad intellectual, you know, that's right. So, so this is the first, first right? Because he's talking about it in a place where there is already the, where there's already the analysis. There is the chachma. Oh, there is yeah. the cold. There is the they cold logic. Those are the words you use, right? Cold logic is the is the expression the, is the expression that's used, and 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 heated emotions. And so when you only have the cold logic, then there's like you need to pour in some some of the heated that's emotion in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to 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 pull it together. So that was one thing. I don't want to go through all the plagues right now, but what I do want to talk about is a very interesting thing that happens at the end. We talk about the barad. Which is all the way at the end. Stam, another, another, one of the, one of the, I forgot his name, but he's like one of, like a modern, like a, a Musar Rav, like he, he's a Russian Shiva and like a military Shiva. He talked about that the Nile turning to blood was showing the people of Egypt what the essence of the Nile really was, where they worshiped the Nile, Stam, whatever, where they worshiped the Nile and they thought this was because Egypt has no water. So the Nile used to overflow and they would have their water from the Nile. And, um, and so they worship the Nile, but really they, he, was say, he, he, was, he was saying that, that the Egyptians, and even, even, in a, even like with the end, of, towards the end of the exile or the beginning, at some point of the exile, when they were throwing the boys into the river, it wasn't necessarily that it was done so out and out. Like it was done... Like the order was out. Like if you find them Jewish babies, you can just throw them into the river. But then if they would come and say, oh my gosh, my baby's missing this. So the police would say, bring me the witnesses. We have to take care of this. Like terrible, this is a terrible thing. So there was like this undercurrent of bad that was being um, encouraged. And so, and so he says that the Nile actually was in its source full of blood. It was full of all the people that had been killed in the Nile. All the babies that had been killed in the Nile. And all of a sudden, you're bringing it to the forefront. Sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the truth. To show the truth. And the first place of healing is to highlight the truth. Mm -hmm. not, to, not, to, not to kid yourself and say, but it's not. Okay. So then another, now totally different area um, is if you go all the way to the end, um, the last play that we said was the hail. And the hail was the a ball of ice with fire inside. So Rashi right away says that opposite forces come together to do the work of Hashem. Okay, so that's not the point that I want to make here. But what's interesting is that towards the end, chapter nine, verse 27, and 28, and 29. So Parah calls Moshe and he says like, no, this is, you know, Hashem is, Hashem is right. I, I, my nation and I, we're all, we're wicked. And please Davin to take away the, to take away this hail. And I'm going to take you out and I'll send you out. And you, I can't, I can't take this anymore. Right. So Moshe says in verse 29, I'm going to leave the city. I'm going to spread out my hands in prayer and the thunder will stop and the whatever hail will not continue to fall so that you should know that Hashem owns everything. And, um, and, uh, and he says, he says in verse 30, do you have it? Nishta, I want to read verse 30. Mm -hmm. chapter, chapter nine, verse 30. Um, English, English. But as for you and your servants, I know that you still have no fear of the Lord God. Okay, so he says, first of all, I know that what you're saying is not, you're not really authentic. Okay, keep going. The flax and the barley were smitten. For the barley was already in corn, and the flax were already in stock. The wheat and spelt were not smitten, for they are late to rape. Moshe departed from time. Right, so then Moshe, he leaves. So he basically has his random, these random two verses in the middle. These crops got ruined. Those crops didn't didn't grow yet. So some of us say he's threatening Pare. 
I know you don't really, like you didn't really buy into this totally. We'll stop this play. Those crops are ruined. And, you know, there's still more that haven't sprouted yet. And like, eh, we have more to, you know, attack. That's some of the parts we talk about. But in, in Hasidus, it talks about what is the difference between the, the grains that were, that were, that were, what was the difference between the grains that were destroyed and the grains that were not yet destroyed? So you could say that these, they, so, so the Chumash says that the wheat and the, and the spelt were a phalos, they're soft, right? So these were fully grown. So they got the, the, the oh, I'm losing my English. The hail comes down and they got destroyed. And the ones that are soft, they did, they, they kind of made it through. And so in Hasidus, they talk about this idea of, and he brings a Gemara also about the about not to be as um, as firm as an oak tree, but to be uh, fluid or something. I don't remember the exact word. As a, as a willow, that the wheat, the 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 grains that had already grown, right? If you ever see a, a field of grain, they're standing tall. They're not trees, but they're fully they're stalks and they're strong and they right and they metaphorically are saying. I got my space, you can't knock me down, I can protect. And, it, and the Gemara uses the expression of an oak tree, which you really see that image much more than a wheat stalk. But the place of, this is who I am, and I am, and then a big wind comes and smacks you down. But the wheat and the spelt that are more, ugh, they're softer, they're able to like, you know, not be wishy-washy, because wishy-washy is not good, but they're able to be pliant and, and, and move with the direction that the wind is blowing because their roots are very strong. The outside part of them, their outside manifestation isn't the strongest part of them. That they could, they could move. They could, you know, I don't have to prove my point. The Gemara actually uses the example with the tree that a, 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 the, when the wind comes and the tree says, you know, like it holds itself and says, take me down. You know, Lukmar doesn't actually say that word, but like that's the example that he uses for the, like that the oak tree sort of holds its strength and says, and challenges the wind where the willow kind of bends with the wind. And here in a, in a, a more gentle form, we have it with different kinds of grains. The ones that are already, I am made and this is who I am and you can't change my mind and I've set up my, my things. And then sometimes life comes and smacks you down and it isn't necessarily the best way to go. On the other hand, we're not looking for people to be, you know, flip flop, and today I say this, and tomorrow I say that. So, the, so then the question is, like, really, where are your roots? Am I flip flopping because it's more important for me to stay alive and to be able to, you know, to to come to to live another day, or or is it really my roots that are very weak? And one of the it's an interesting it's an interesting story that in the Reb Chaim Brisker, who uh, was the founder of the Brisk Yeshiva. I don't remember what year he lived, but there was a very, very big plague, and a lot of people were getting city. Were forgetting city. A lot of people were getting sick and they were dying, and it was a question of being weak and not being able to hold your strength. And he decreed that on Yom Kippur, everybody has to eat. Everybody has to eat on Yom Kippur because nobody can get their strength low from fasting because they'd then be susceptible susceptible to whatever this terrible disease I was going through. So his his disciples said to him like. You're like so blasé about Yom Kippur. He says, no, I'm not being, you know, blasé about Yom Kippur. I'm being very machmir. I'm being very um, stringent. stringent with saving people's lives. And, and, and if you really have the core properly, if your roots are in a solid place, then we could be flexible and not have to like prove our point all the time. And I think that in our lives, in our relationships, that is something that could be very helpful. Like if we said, there are times that we need to stand our ground. I'm not saying we should always just like, oh, whatever, it doesn't matter. I have no standards and I don't know. Whatever. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I think sometimes we stand on principle to our detriment and we don't know how to get off the tree to, to, be, to, to open up a place of healing and to open up a place of reconciliation because we're so right. How could I say that I'm not right? And, and, and one of the, the last maka for our parsha is really teaching us that place of balance, that there is, we could be right and still be, and still lose. 
it, the, the point isn't to necessarily win every battle. The, the place is where am I going to continue and how am I going to further my relationship with Hashem, my relationship with other people? Am I so standing on principle that I totally lost? And, and at the same time, we do need to have the places where we, we do have, you know, we, we don't just say, oh, anything goes and it's fine and it's, you know, whatever. Like my friends is about a Disney, Disney, like, you know, Disney movies, the assimilationist always wins and they always need their parents' blessing. Like, it's not enough that I, I'm not going to go with your lifestyle, but you need to agree. You need to bless me and say, it's going to be, it's great, my child, do that. I'm not saying that, but there has to be a place of understanding that not everything that we do is everybody's way. And even in our, even in, even in a, a, even in a circle as small as our own family, we need to understand that it's more important to keep a family than to be, stand on a principle that you know, yeah, you're right. But now you, now, now you destroy the family. So like, how is that helpful? Um, and it's an ongoing process and it's an ongoing balance. So I want to give us a bracha that we're, we're dealing with a time of Makkah. We're dealing with a, a place that the Parsha is talking about all the different plagues. It shouldn't take big boulders hitting us on the head for us to be able to see what we are and aren't doing right. We should be able to look into ourselves, we should be able to look into our medias and we should be able to say, what do I need to fix? What do I need to tweak? This is, this is the week, these are the weeks of the rectification of where we have taken a mida that in its source is good and powerful and holy. And we've done that somehow. And it isn't, you know, we've, we've, we've manipulated it or we've moved it in a way that it isn't holy and beautiful anymore. And our job is, and our power is to be able to move it back into a holy space. And so I want to give us all a bracha that we, that we be honest, that we start, we add passion into our lives with our head and also to be able to say, where can I be flexible? Where do I need to be strict? And to be able to deal with healing for ourselves and for the people around us. Have an awesome rest of the week.